Okay, there we go. So this uh, is uh, first 45 minutes. Um, I want to talk about the daily office, the, the history, um, the theology, and the spirituality of it. And then we'll take a little break and then we'll do basically how to use it, the practicality, the ministry with the prayer book. Um, going back to the, <clears throat> to the introduction to our prayer book 2019 on page six, there, there is a good paragraph defining um, the daily, uh, daily office, daily morning and evening prayer. And, and, and so this is quoting right from it, it's on page six. Daily morning and evening prayer are the established rites or offices by which both corporately and individually, God's people annually encounter the whole of the Holy Scriptures, daily confess their sins and praise Almighty God and offer timely thanksgivings, petitions, and intercessions. The prayer book tradition has historically expected clergy to pray the daily office morning and evening each day. There's a lot in there. I think I mentioned last time, and uh, John, you didn't hear this, that, that um, I, I think much of this has been, was written by Archbishop Duncan, who was the kind of the overseer of this uh, prayer book uh, edition. Um, but there's a lot we could unpack there um, that, uh, that we'll see uh, borne out by, by the rest of what I have to say um, this morning. The, the first is it's corporate and individual. I'm going to say more about that later. Um, but, but as we look at, at the daily office, particularly morning prayer and evening prayer, uh, um, these are both um, for corporate worship but also for, for private or, or personal worship individually that, that's, uh, that's done. And the, and the two go together. Um, and so it's, it's good to see this. Martin Thornton, who I'm gonna quote later, talks about the prayer book as, as um, among other things, a beautifully constructed system of spirituality. It is to nourish us um, both corporately and individually in our spiritual life. More to say about that. Um, that that um, by a, God's people annually encounter the whole of the scriptures. You remember last time we talked about one uh, of the principal concerns of Thomas Cranmer as, as a reformer, uh, as the chief architect of the prayer book is that the prayer book um, would introduce the people of the Church of England to scripture, that, that they would, they would um, hear read, because many of them were, of course, illiterate, not all, but that they would hear read in, in the morning and evening prayer, pretty much the whole of the Bible every year um, with repeats on, on gospels and, and epistles. Um, and so there is the idea that we, we, need, we need people to know what's in the Bible and they need to know all of the Bible because this is where holiness begins. And remember Cranmer's uh, preface talks about that the, the knowledge of scripture is, is um, how certainly um, reading and digesting uh, scripture is, the goal of this is holiness, the whole holy life. Um, daily confess their sins and praise almighty God. Um, the daily office is that, and, and I'll say more about that later. It is a daily office. Um, it is meant to be prayed um, and, and used by Anglicans on a, on a daily basis. Um, that, in, in my generation in the Episcopal Church, that had pretty much vanished. <laughs> and one of the things that, that, that the 2019 prayer book in the Anglican Church North America um, are, are trying to do is to bring us back to what is our Anglican heritage, which is not just a regular Eucharist and the Eucharistic rites, um, but is indeed um, a daily office. It's something that informs us day by day by day, morning prayer, evening prayer, and, and the other office, uh, offices that have been uh, read. In, in, the, in the Episcopal Church, um, if, if you took the 79 prayer book um, during my time in the Episcopal Church and you turned it on the end, there would be a dirty streak right in the middle. 
And that would be that would be the the Eucharistic rites. And that was the part of the prayer book that was used. It was like uh, in in many respects, the rest of the prayer book, including um, morning prayer and evening prayer, which were in the beginning, were very rarely used. Um, and so we're trying to call people back um, as churches and individuals in, into the daily office there. Uh, and uh, as it says, offer timely thanksgivings, petitions, intercessions. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the prayer book traditionally has historically expected clergy to pray the daily office morning and evening. That, that was never made an explicit command in American prayer books, but it was in the 1552, uh, uh, 1559 and 1662 British prayer books, the English prayer books that was specifically directed that clergy will pray um, the, these offices. So history of the daily office, where did the daily office come from? It, it didn't just magically appear in the first prayer book. Um, James White, who was uh, chair of the liturgy department in Notre Dame for years, uh, even though he's a United Methodist, uh, interesting that a United Methodist would be chair of the, the liturgy, liturgy studies at at a premier Roman Catholic uh, institution, but he was he was an in, uh, incredibly learned scholar of, of liturgy. I had the privilege of talking to him several times. Um, his, his book, um, Introduction to Christian Worship, actually, I think that's the third edition, which is a really, for someone who doesn't know anything about the history of Christian worship, it's a really good intro. It's not specifically for Anglicans, but it, kind of spans the spectrum of Christian worship. So um, he, uh, in his section in, in uh, a couple of pages on the prayer book, this is what he wrote. The success story in daily public prayer of the Reformation was in the Church of England. Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, chief architect of the Book of Common Prayer of 1549 and 1552, was familiar with the work of the continental reformers and Cardinal Quinones, he combined matins, lauds, and primes from the medieval sarum breviary into matins, while vespers and compline were condensed into even song. Um, when, when you think of the great Reformation traditions, the Lutherans, um, do, you, do you think of morning prayer and evening prayer with Lutherans? They have it, <laughs> but, but you don't think it. When you think of the reform tradition, you think of morning prayer and evening prayer? No. You think of a lot of things in the Reformed Church, and, and I can go through. When you think of the Anglican tradition and the Anglican prayer book, boom. And that's that's why White says that that the real success story of morning prayer and evening prayer is, is in the Anglicans. We're, we, we are the ones who, um, in some ways, brought that form to, um, to kind of a... a created a useful form and then institutionalized it in the life of the church and, and individual private worship in a way that Lutherans, the Reformed, the other traditions um, ha have, have not. Even though they have, um, they have a daily office. If you've seen um, Lutheran, um, they usually put it in the hymnal. If you've seen Lutheran hymnals, um, Presbyterians have, uh, have hymnals and, and books of worship. Um, because I was Congregational United Church of Christ, uh, my, my original ordination. Um, I, I have a worship book from the UCC and it has, it has the daily office in it again, but um, it, was, uh, it was not a real a part of that uh, tradition um, used by people. Um, and so what this paragraph tells us is that, that um, Cranmer, um, Brings to uh, brings a structure and a learning to to his architecture of morning prayer, um, but he doesn't do that out of nothing. He he does that using um, these sources. So I've listed some of some of the the ways we can think about um, daily morning and evening prayer, starting back in in uh, in the Old and the New Testament. Um, I, I'm sure in your in your praying the Psalms, your study of the Psalms, you've you've um, run run across the verse in Psalm 119. If 
uh, I think it's 119, 164. I couldn't tell you what verse it is. I had to look it up. But it talks about praying seven times a day. Um, and uh, by the way, if you're doing the daily office, um, if you're praying the Psalms every month, you pray through 119 morning and evening prayer every month. If you spread it out over two months, as I do, following the daily office lectionary, every two months you're praying through Psalm 119. So you're going to hit that verse sooner. Um, uh, but it, it appears that the, uh, well, the, the seven times a day um, becomes the basis for which the, the uh, monastic um, liturgy hours. Um, there are eight, eight liturgies and, and then one attached to, to daily Eucharist. But the idea for, for praying roughly every, every three hours a day in monastic life, um, certainly one of the sources for that is in the, the verse in Psalm 119. Uh, probably probably um, Jewish piety certainly from, from the time of Daniel on, is that prayers were offered three times a day um, by, uh, by pious Jews. And, and you, if you grew up, as I did with the Bible stories, um, you always remember that, that Daniel is captured and thrown into the den of lions. Why? Because he opens his window <laughs> towards Jerusalem. He's praying three times a day, um, evening, uh, morning and, and noonday. And so that structure of regular prayers um, really takes root in, in Second Temple Jerusalem, uh, Second Temple Judaism, uh, where, where you have a morning and evening sacrifice, and then two, two um, basically uh, prayer offices of, of uh, psalms and prayers. That, by the way, um, in Acts chapter 3, where, where Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray. They're going up to have a little uh, spontaneous prayer meeting. They're going up for the regular set prayers. And so um, part of our, our Christian rootedness in, in, in Israel, in the life of Israel, is that, that we have inherited this idea of regular daily prayer. And that, that's very apparent early on in, in the life of the Christian church. By the time you get to the Didache, which I don't know uh, when you want to date that, you know, AD 90, AD 100, it's already talking about um, basically prescribing um, prayer times a day, uh, kind of a, a daily office prayer. And, and you find that um, carried on in the second and, and the third century in a number of texts. Um, and particularly at the end of the fourth century, in the Apostolic Constitution, you've got now um, morning and evening prayer, um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, this is this; these are regular prayer offices, prayer services that include recitation of psalms, um, uh, portions of scripture, and and set prayers, and they're usually prayed in in the cathedral church. So they're often called the cathedral office or sometimes called the people's office. Um, the idea being that you, you have your cathedral church in a, in a city. And so every day uh, you have, to use our terms, you have morning and evening prayer. Um, and people that it's led by the clergy, but, but these are offices where not only are our lay people invited, but they're encouraged to come and, and, and attend. It is not a preaching office, um, uh, which is not to say that that couldn't occur in there, but that's not basically what it is. It's recitation of prayers, psalms, and, and reading of scripture um, there. Probably one of, one of the best sources um, that we have describing this is from uh, a woman by the name of Egeria, um, who is, uh, comes to Jerusalem in the late 300s and gives us lots of good data. Have, have any of you um, uh, read or encountered any of the stuff that Egeria uh, wrote? Um, I, I see heads nodding. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, th that would be, I, I, I should have I put that in resources because this, she's an amazing source. She tells us what Holy Week was like. 
in, in, in Jerusalem in about 380, 381 in that area. Um, we don't really know who she was. She was probably a, uh, a woman possibly from Spain on a pilgrimage. She's, she's writing all this stuff down. She takes it back to, to, uh, to her, her sisters there. Um, and that gives us account of palm processions, for instance, and, and a lot of the things that we do on, uh, on Holy Week are, are, uh, have been developed in, in the second half of the fourth century there in Jerusalem and are spreading out because of, of course, this is, this is where it all happens um, at uh, uh, so many of those things. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was rector uh, both at uh, St. Luke's Episcopal Church and then at Holy Spirit, um, I would always introduce on, on Palm Sunday as we stood outside in, uh, you know, in the street or in the parking lot or in the, in the courtyard at St. Luke's. Um, uh, as we stood out there, um, I would read a little bit from her account and what she saw. And I said, what we're doing today, um, we know some of these things from Egeria. And uh, Aster, you want me to spell Egeria, so let me put it down. Let me just check to make sure I've got it right here. Thank it's, you. I didn't know if it was a jury or no jury. I couldn't it, hear. It. it starts with an E and it's pronounced like Nigeria. Um, uh, it's an E. Okay. Nigeria. There we go. Okay. Nigeria. Thank you for asking me that. Um, yeah, it's not clear what it is. So, so we have... Um, back to back to the uh, cathedral office. So we have the jury's account of what the cathedral office was like in Jerusalem, and that doesn't mean it was it was that way every place. Um, but it's it's kind of uh, if they're doing it in Jerusalem, well, why aren't we doing it here? <laughs> and that's that that's uh, kind of things that we see spreading out from some of her her writings there, and not not specifically because of her writings. We know that pilgrims were all, pilgrims would come and they would take home with them. Hey, have you heard what they do in Jerusalem on such and such a day? Have you heard? And so this is going on in the second half of the fourth century, and and liturgy is is spreading out. Um, there are still uh, still lots of variations that are spreading out and particularly being brought back to Rome, which is going to be important for, for medieval liturgy in, in the West. Uh, again, Esther, as I said last time, I'm not a student of, of Eastern liturgy. So um, I, I know the Catholic tradition. I don't know a whole lot about the, the Orthodox tradition when it comes to uh, to some of this stuff, but that's that's where we are. Of course, we're rooted in 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 the West and in, in the in the Church of Rome, and so many of our things come from there. At the same time, you have um, basically a, a morning and an evening prayer cathedral office. Um, uh, you also have the development of monastic offices. For a while, they're they're parallel. So as the as as monasteries begin to take root, particularly the Benedictine monasteries, um, you, you have them offering the Liturgy of the Hours, um, and those are open to lay people who, who can come and uh, be part of it and participate. Um, and so you have both of these tracks going. You have cathedral office and monastic office, um, but one fades. It, we already see it happening in, in you know, the 400s and 500s. Um, the cathedral office fades and more and more of the worship life of the church is done where? In, in the monasteries. And, and so it's, it's um, not only, but it's primarily in the West, the Benedictines, who, um, who give us the, the eight offices of the hours um, and, uh, and have have people invited to come and join them, there's still some lay participation in it. That grows less and less and less and less um, throughout the Middle Ages. And you no longer have, have uh, cathedral offices. Um, and what you begin to have by the 12th and 13th century 
um, the, the monastic offices are, are, are choral offices. Um, they're sung offices. You have to know how to sing it. You have to know how to chant in Latin. You have to know all the ins and outs of it. Ha have any of you ever um, um, spent some time in retreat in a Benedictine monastery? Mm. It, it's an experience. <laughs> um, um, Esther, I think we have our, our uh, presbyter's retreat scheduled for, uh, I, I think it's St. Andrews, as I recall the name of it. Yeah. Yeah, and, I've been there twice. Okay. I've so, been there twice. So, so from your, from your, from your, um, from your own background, you probably weren't as lost as the first time I went to something like that. But it's very involved. The chanting is involved. You have to know where to change pitch. You have to, you know, there, there are all these movable parts. And by the late Middle Ages, you had to have ten books to know um, to know how to participate in this. So it becomes totally a monastic office, um, chanted and sung. Where, where the Psalms are, the chanting the Psalms are, are, is the principal work. In some places, you, you chant the whole Psalter every day. Um, in some places, uh, uh, the whole Psalter every week. If you were really lax, the whole Psalter in a month <laughs> kind of thing. And, and so you're doing this day after day after day. And so you memorize this. So after a time, you don't. Uh, you don't need this, but it becomes um, kind of a professional type of thing. And if you're a lay person who happens to come in, you're, you're just, you're an observer because this is not something that you can participate in. Remember Cranmer's idea of participation. It's not just that, that the liturgy needs to be done in the language of the people. It's that the liturgy needs to be simplified so people know what the heck is going on. If if you want a fun way to um, see what the liturgy of the hours in a Benedictine monastery um, might have felt like, I, I always recommend that that people read some of the Brother Cadfile murder mysteries. Um, they're they're set in a uh, in a fictional monastery in uh, in the west of England in uh, the twelfth uh, century, thirteenth century. I think it's the twelfth century. And so while, he, while Brother Cadfile, who's a brother in the monastery, um, you know, he's off solving murders, but he always has to get back for the, for the offices. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's fun because it gives you, it, it, in a lighthearted, um, non-technical way, it, it gives you uh, kind of a feel what, for, for what monastic life was like, particularly the worship life. It also is a great, um, it, it it's a great way to see the importance of relics and, and how relics become so central to monastic life in, in England in the late Middle Ages. But that's another topic um, there. Um, but what if you're a monk and you're traveling? What if, what if you're not in the monastery? What do you do? And uh, of course, in the late Middle Ages, we begin to have the mendicant orders that, that are, are traveling orders. And, and so you've got to take those services and you've got to put them in a form of something that can be carried around. And, and that's why you begin to get the advent of something called the, the breviary, which is basically the liturgy of the hours, slimmed down, put in a book so traveling monks can, can, can use it. Um, uh, Thomas Merton talks about this in his famous autobiography, um, the, the Seven Story Mountain, if you've ever read Merton. A wonderful book, by the way, to read. I try to read it every few years. Um, but um, the, these, so you've got these elaborate um, services of the hours with chanting and music and movable parts and lives of the saints and scripture gets squeezed out. Um, Remember last week, we looked at the introduction to the first prayer book. And, and what Cranmer is talking about is, is not, not so much the Eucharist, although he's talking about that. He's talking about um, the liturgy of the hours in, in these monasteries. Um, 
where they have this and that, and you never know what's in the Bible because it's St. Swithin's Day. And so now we had to read from the life of St. Swithin. And so to have time and, and to be able to say all the Psalms, we'll read a verse, one verse from the scripture. Um, and, and all of the complicated books to know whose day it is, what is a feast, what is a fast, uh, it, it, becomes, um, it becomes a real professional work. Um, and and that, that drives then the reform of this. So, so in the Reformation, you have the, the, the Reformation churches who want to continue um, um, a daily office of some sort, but what do they want to make it? Uh, and, and I'm not ta just talking about Cranmer, I'm talking about you know, Luther, um, um, Bucer in Strasbourg, uh, Calvin, um, the, the reformers. They want to they want to preserve the the daily office, but but they want to simplify it. They want to make it so people can participate, and and they want to make it a time for people to begin to hear or read the scriptures. Um, so this is not just Cranmer's concern. This is a concern for all the reformers, starting with Luther, and. Uh, and so um, Luther attempts to put together a liturgy. Um, um, the, uh, and, and Cranmer, uh, if you know something of, of his life, he spends some time as an envoy from Henry VIII in the early 1530s, where? In, in Germany. And he actually um, surreptitiously marries uh, a, a, a German woman there and keeps, keeps that marriage hidden for years, <laughs> um, uh, particularly when he becomes Archbishop of Canterbury <laughs> at that point. But, but that's, that's the little biographical interesting piece. But he's also absorbing German, not just German theology, but he is, he is absorbing German liturgy. And, and again, not just the, the Eucharistic liturgy, although that's certainly important, but also he's looking, what, what is Luther? What are the Lutherans doing? With, with the daily office. Um, he's influenced, Cranmer is influenced by, by the, the reform tradition too. I mentioned last time that, that Martin Bucer um, ha has quite an influence on him, particularly the, the prayer book of 1552 from, from the Strasbourg liturgy. But there's also, a, um, uh, there's also um, some evidence that uh, Strasbourg is producing a daily office. Now, what is the daily office? It's, it's the opportunity not only to, to pray and to praise and to hear the scripture. It's also a time for a good long reform sermon. And that's particularly true in Zwingli, where a daily office becomes basically a, a preaching event. So you have the move kind of away from prayer and praise in the Psalms more in the direction of, of what we would call a Bible study, expository preaching uh, on a daily basis, um, morning and evening. And so Cranmer is, and, and the English reformers are, are exposed to all of this. This, this, is not, this is not, oh, here's, here's the English Reformation and here's the German and here's the Swiss and here's the French. Um, sometimes we talk as if they were in silos they're all corresponding with one another. They're visiting one another. They're, they're fighting one another. You know, who, who can be more, more reformed? Uh, have, you, have you departed the faith and things like this? It's a, it's a really interesting and messy, uh, messy period. And there are Roman Catholic reformers who have the same concerns. I mentioned Card Cardinal Canone. Um, he's, he is, He's trying to do the same with the, the, the daily office, and he introduces uh, uh, his own breviary, which, which he uh, attempts to do a lot of this thing. And Cranmer knows all of this stuff. He's collecting it. He's, he's looking at the, the, the liturgies, and particularly he's looking <coughs> at, at, um, at what's called the Sarum Rite, um, Salisbury. Sarum is, is the old the old name for uh, the Salisbury area. And it's the Sarum rite of the liturgy that Cranmer draws on most heavily. So I have a, I have a chart in one of my books, all the things he takes and all the arrows. It, it, 
it uh, it drives you insane <laughs> when you're trying to to figure out what he did with with what. He begins working on this in the 1530s, and by the early 1540s, he has basically developed um, two services um, for um, for the daily office: uh, morning prayer and evening prayer. Now he can't unveil those until Henry dies, and and he can. Um, he can launch the prayer book in 1549, um, but but he is already working on it. He's mulling it over. He's running it by people. He um, he's he's doing some really interesting stuff on that. And, and, and what he does, as this quote says, he takes um, the monastic offices of of Matins, Lauds, and Prime from the Sarum Breviary, and and he calls it Matins, which is just you know, morning. And then he takes Vester and Compline and he makes it into um, uh, even song. So in the 1549 prayer book, there are two daily offices, uh, matins and even song. And they both begin the same way, um, praying to our father together in a loud voice, the priest leads, by the way, if you look at the 1549 prayer book. And then and then um, right into to, um, uh, Oh Lord, open our lips, the, the, the precies, um, the, the short prayers at the beginning in, in uh, dialogue form. Um, and, and this is his first, uh, his first run at the prayer book. When you look at the second prayer book, 1552, this is the influence of Martin Bucer again. Um, because now how does morning prayer begin in 1552? It does not begin with the Our Father. It begins with opening sentences, a call to confession, confession of sin and absolution. Does that sound familiar? And that has been the opening of morning prayer um, since 1552. Um, it is not yet the opening of evening prayer. Uh, evening prayer does not uh, have that same structure until the 1662 prayer book, um, where it accommodates to morning prayer. They basically develop the same structure there. But but notice that 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 is that is the influence of the Continental Reformation, and I'll say more about that. Before you can come into the presence of God, um, you need to acknowledge your sinfulness. Um, and know that we are sinful people coming before a holy God who, who has abundant forgiveness. But, but if, if, you don't, if you don't come in by that door, um, you have not understood the, the theology of, of the prayer book. I'll talk about that in a little bit later uh, as we go through. Uh, I remember reading years ago, uh, uh, it was a... A rabbinic story about how someone came to the rabbi and, and said, uh, uh, tell me, rabbi, in the olden days, um, um, the Lord God appeared to the fathers. Why does he not appear to us now? And the rabbi is reported to have said, because no one bows low enough. Um, and if, if you get the impact of that, you, you can understand Cranmer's thinking at morning prayer. Um, you need to bow low enough. You, you need to be the Pharisee in Luke, I, sorry, you need to be the publican, not the Pharisee in Luke 18, starting morning prayer by saying, um, ha have mercy on me, a sinner, O Lord. Um, and and that, is, that is the theology there. A um, couple of, of things from there. Um, Cranmer intended the... Uh, the Holy Eucharist to be the regular Sunday service is very apparent from his, his writings. Um, the, the difficulty was coming out of late medieval times, the um, people were not used to receiving communion. Um, communion in the late Middle Ages was a once a year affair, um, maybe twice a year, but a once a year affair at, at Easter. And so the regular reception of communion um, was not a practice that most people um, understood or were comfortable with. And Cranmer wanted to make it a regular practice, um, but um, it, it took a long time to catch on. 
um, like the 20th century, maybe. Um, and, and so very soon, um, what evolved as the standard Anglican Sunday morning service was morning prayer, followed by litany. And we're going to look at litany in two weeks, followed by the communion service, except it was usually um, simply the anti-communion, the part up until the offertory, because very few, if any, would, would receive, and only those who receive would stay. So, so if you want to know how Anglicans worshipped from, um, from the late 1500s until the 1800s on Sunday morning, there it was. Morning prayer, litany, anti-communion. And uh, changes happen in the eight, in the nineteenth century um, uh, along that uh, that line. Um, the uh, an evening prayer was done in the afternoon, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it's you know it's England. It gets dark in the winter at at four o'clock. So you do evening prayer at three, preceded by uh, catechesis. So catechesis usually done before evening prayer. And so uh, parents would bring their children and would stay um, and watch the catechesis. And that was kind of the standard practice for English uh, church life. Now I want to stop here and, and, and um, well, I'm going to, I'll pick that up later. Um, what happens in the 19th century is, is morning prayer really becomes the standard service for most Anglicans on Sunday morning. And, and evening prayer, Sunday afternoon, you go morning prayer and evening prayer. And you might have communion four times a year, um, but, but morning and evening prayer become the standard service. Um, read Victorian novels, um, read Anthony Trollope. Um, he, uh, he gives wonderful, if, if sometimes snarky descriptions of church life uh, and worship life um, there. What morning and evening prayer become, at least for middle class and upper class households, is they become, it becomes all, the, the daily prayer part of it becomes something that's done in a household. So if you're a fairly well-to-do household in London, um, and, and you're a reasonably pious household, say Victorian times, um, at, at nine o'clock, everybody gathers, you know, father, mother, kids, servants. Um, for morning prayer, which the father leads. And then you will gather in the, in the late afternoon for evening prayer. And, and so um, in, in an interesting way, notice the movement from, from the prayer services, cathedral and monastic office into, into simply a monastic office. Cranmer wants to make it available for everybody, again, morning prayer and evening prayer in, in the first prayer books for the parish church um, and, and, and so it's supposed to be done daily for the village so people can understand uh, the scripture. And that's why there are long passages of scripture read. Um, but then it moves into the house and becomes a household service for many people, it, which is not to say that it doesn't continue in churches. But, but if you can pull it off, you do that as, as a household. And so morning prayer takes different forms as, as Anglicans. Um, and, and particularly becomes a, a family service in the 19th century. That leads me to kind of my last uh, thing here, which is daily office in the 1979 prayer book. Remember, Cranmer had taken all of those medieval services uh, in the monastery and pushed them into two. What the 20th century does, and you see this in the, in the 79 American prayer book, is it begins to pull them apart again. So if you know the 79 prayer book, which is, of course, the prayer book I used for years and that I was trained on, you have morning prayer, you have noonday prayer, you have evening prayer, and you've got Compline. Now, um, uh, just a, a, a word to the wise. If you, if you call it Compline, we know you are not an Anglican. So just... It's one of those words, it's a shibboleth. And uh, I, I remember hearing about Compline when I was uh, away at college and uh, uh, I'd come home to Seattle 
and a big Episcopal cathedral there was, was having Compline that was packing them in at nine o'clock at night and hundreds of people were coming. I say, what is Compline? And that's what everybody called it. And then when I went a few years later, when I had become an Episcopalian, I went, oh, that's Compline. I've been mispronouncing it all these years, uh, kind of thing. But you notice what what those what it's it's pulling again some apart, and that has that has um, that is passed into our ACNA prayer book. So there is there is morning prayer. We've renamed it. We call it midday prayer, evening prayer, and uh, and and Compline, and uh, and so we've got four of those, but, but the original understanding is that kind of the core of our worship life, both corporately and individually, our daily worship life is morning, the core is morning prayer and evening prayer. And uh, that, that's what I said, the ACNA wants to uh, continue to, uh, continue to, to promote in this. Okay, um, I've, I've talked for a long time, so let's take about a five minute break, okay? And, and uh, you know, I, I love history, so I probably spent too long on it, but I got in some of my remarks I wanna make about theology and spirituality. So we can, we can run through those quickly before we get into the actual practice uh, of the daily office. So about five minutes um, and then we'll pick up again.
Okay. I have to have my cup of tea for 11 Z's, but, uh, but it's, it's Lent. So now, uh, no muffins or donuts <laughs> during Lent. Okay, give John a minute or so more um, because I wanna talk for a few minutes about the theology and spirituality um, from the daily office. And, it, and in some sense, things that I've, I've covered today will apply to other parts of the prayer book too. So in, in the, in the future, as we're talking about them, I, I won't need to spend so much time on, uh, on some of this. <clears throat> okay, as we talked about last time, um, um, there is a sense in which uh, um, lex orande, lex credendi, the, the law of praying or worshiping is the law of believing. And as I added, uh, Esther, you, rem you remembered that. Uh, Lex Vivendi, the, the law of living, that, that the prayer book is not um, just that it teaches uh, that, that we learn a theology and forms inherited in, in the prayers. The Alex, um, which I'm going to talk about. Okay. Turn off my camera for a minute. And get back up. Okay, I think I'm back now. Thumbs up if you can hear me. If I'm not freezing, okay, good. There, there is a theology behind the prayer book, um, which informed kind of prayers and choices that Cranmer made. And you see that particularly in the collects, we're going to have a, a time we'll talk about the collects, how he used medieval collects, but, but rewrote parts of them. Um, and, and so, um, I guess the question with theology in the daily office is what what theology is is apparent in it, and I think it's I think it's apparent because Cranmer intended it to be a, a apparent. Um, the architect of the prayer book was to teach um, uh, a reformed Catholicism um, in in uh, in doctrine. So uh, a little bit on Reformation. This came out a couple of years actually now, and uh, John Yates the third um, in it. He he began with a confession of humanity's profound spiritual neediness in the face of its ongoing struggle with self-centered waywardness. As a result, Cranmer made the essence of Anglican worship. Notice the essence of Anglican worship: turning to God because of sin, so as to be turned to God. I, I think that that is a, a, a wonderful um, summary of what's going on in, in the, the daily office morning prayer and evening prayer. You turn to God so that God might turn you. Um, so, so that, that your, your life, not, you're not just forgiven, but your life is turned around and you live towards God gratitude. As is done for you. Now, I, I think if I can put it that way, um, the the first is is certainly uh, morning prayer is is Catholic um, in in several sense. Um, 
certainly late mid-Romantic period, and, and, and you see that in traditional forms and texts. Um, Cran Cranmer, throughout the prayer book, but again in morning prayer and evening prayer, is not just saying we're going to tear it all up and invent something new. He's, he's using, he's reforming, he's using things, he's pruning, he's changing, he's simplifying, but he is using what has passed to him from the tradition. Um, he thinks in morning prayer and evening prayer, church actually prayed together but that's that's what oh, camera because sometimes that helps if i turn off my camera as long as you can hear me that's the important thing okay um but but um notice too that that morning prayer and evening prayer are trinitarian they're 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 nicene um the the the, the Christology is the Christology, you know, of the fourth and fifth centuries. Um, the the creed that you say in in morning prayer and evening prayer is is the the baptismal creed from Rome, the the uh, the Apostles' Creed and uh, Roman origin, and, and and so there is a theology implicit and explicit that says we. We're not reinventing the faith. We are simply um, trying to get back to what is what is universal, what has been taught and held at all times in all places in, in, in the Catholic uh, tradition. The second theological emphasis, and this speaks to um, the quote from uh, the Reformation Anglican book, is um, that there is definitely an Augustinian anthropology and soteriology in, in morning prayer and evening prayer. Um, again, and that's not just morning prayer and evening prayer, it's throughout the prayer book. Um, and what do I mean by an Augustinian uh, anthropology? Uh, I, I mean that we as, we as individual human beings and, and the human race um, cannot save ourselves. Uh, the, the taint of sin, um, and, and he's drawing on Luther too, the bondage of the will here, um, that, that we cannot turn to God um, unless by God's grace he draws us to himself. And, and so um, you see that, that theology expressed in morning prayer and, and evening prayer again and again and again. There's a third, I think, theological current. It's very evangelical. Um, and by that, I mean um, the importance of Bible knowledge for holiness. Um, we we want to be Bible centered. We want the scripture to be the, the priority in our lives. We want to know it because we know without that, we, we, cannot, we cannot grow in the holiness that, that God wants to grow in, in us. And so the, the, the vast amount of scripture um, read, if you, one of the complaints um, as we were putting together this prayer book is there was so much scripture being read. And, and if you want a 10 minute little, you know, uh, what is it, uh, the uh, Pop-Tart uh, devotional time, <laughs> um, the, the prayer book is not going to do it for you because it takes time. And, and uh, some people said busy people can't, can't read all this scripture, they can't do all the Psalms. And, and, and there is something pastorally we want to hear in that. Um, because we don't want to put um, the daily office beyond the reach of people. Um, that that would not be something that 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 was part of the original prayer book intent. But but we don't want we want to make it you know like um, sugary breakfast cereal either. Um, if I use a food metaphor, uh, we we want it to nourish and sustain us. And part of the way is is the the um, the reading of scripture and all of scripture and the recitation of the Psalms. So, so the, the 2019 prayer book attempts to, to do that without overloading us too much. And as I said last time, I think you can, I think you can do an adequate job of, of morning prayer, um, reading it through in easily within 30 minutes. And, you know, I say to people, 
you find time for that's another emphasis and and then the last emphasis that i think the last current is is and this may be a kind of a misnomer but i, I want to call it the lutheran current <laughs> um, the whole doctrine of the priesthood of all believers in the church and in the world which really has um, two senses uh, in it. it. What people often think it means is that, um, is that, you know, lay people can do stuff in the church now, which is certainly true. Um, and, and lay people can, as you'll notice, lay people can lead morning prayer and evening prayer. Um, you don't have to be clergy to, to lead it. And that's a good thing. In, in, in lots of churches and lots of places, our online morning prayer um, at Holy Spirit Church is mostly led by lay people. And, you know, I lead it once a week, but it's mostly led by lay people. Um, and, and so the kind of, of, of leading of services that is appropriate for the laity is this. But, but the priesthood of all believers means also in the universal priesthood that we serve God in some priestly sense in whatever occupation we're in. And, what Cranmer wants to do in the prayer book is, is take monastic life, the prayer of the Lord God. And he wants um, so that it's not just monasteries that pray and people who work. We, we, all, we all pray and we all work. And, and so there is... There is the idea of the empowering of the laity to, to, to fulfill a priestly function together in the whole world, not just the clergy um, there. And that's, that's very much part of the, the prayer book tradition. And you might find other theological emphases in, in, the, in morning prayer and evening prayer. But um, those are the ones I see. So let's briefly talk about spirituality from the daily office. Uh, Michael Ramsey, um, who is Archbishop of Canterbury, I'm trying to remember, in 50s and 60s, uh, maybe into the 70s, uh, just a, a wonderful little book that, that as, as people prepare for priesthood, I always recommend, it's called The Christian Priest Today. Um, and there are a series of talks he gave <coughs> at uh, pre-ordination retreats for candidates for ordination in the Church of England. Uh, and there's just so much good in this. I, I, don't, I don't know why it isn't more well known. And yeah, maybe it's just the circles I travel in. But, but he says in the Christian priest today, the point of the daily office is to root your prayer in the scriptures and in the church's corporate prayer. The daily office in Psalm and Canonical and Lection tells of God's historic revelation and redemption and of the response of the church down the ages in praise and thanksgiving. We need to soak ourselves in this if our prayer is to be fully in his name and to his glory, and one with the redeemed people of God. In the daily office, we are lifted beyond the contemporary. And, and, and then he goes on to say, it's a long quote, but he goes on to say, if you're not lifted beyond the contemporary, you'll never speak to the contemporary. You, you have pulled out of it, pulled above it in, in, the, in the daily office so, so that you might have something to say back to it. Uh, and I, I think that's, uh, that is very, uh, very telling. So um, three things about the spirituality of the daily office. Once, uh, and I've already talked a little bit about this, it is both corporate and personal. Um, if you are praying the daily office on your own, you're not praying on your own. Um, you are praying with people who are praying the uh, daily office other places uh, and uh, around the globe. And, and so there is no such thing of, of, of praying it privately. You're always praying it corporately. It's whether you're gathered with other people or you're praying it along with them at a distance. Um, in, our, in our prayer book, um, it encourages both, um, both gathering for it, and, and if you can't, then doing it on your own, but, but doing it um, conscious of the fact you're praying with the whole church. Um, second thing about the spirituality from the daily office 
uh, one, one of the books uh, from my own formation um, that was important to me was uh, Richard Foster's The Celebration of Discipline. It's, it's still kicking around and it still has, there are many good things in it, but he, he talks about the different disciplines and uh, spiritual disciplines. And of course, that's, that's a big topic now. Um, we, uh, uh, I, I, one of the things we're, we're doing for Lent is we're talking about spiritual practices. We're not using the word discipline, but it's, that's what we mean is different spiritual practices. Think through what's involved in, in, uh, in morning prayer, evening prayer. Um, and, and what I call it, I, I call morning prayer and evening prayer a bucket of disciplines. Now I didn't invent that term, somebody else came up with it. I don't know who, I'll give them credit if I can think of it. But, but think of all the spiritual practices or disciplines that are woven in to say morning prayer. Confession of sin, praying the Psalms, listening to scripture, prayer of thanksgiving, intercessory prayer, and you go on and on and on and on. And, and so it, praying the daily office is really um, bundling together a number of spiritual disciplines or practices which Christians for the better part of 2000 years have found helpful. Um, the discipline of, of uh, of just doing all of these together rather than, than sorting it out. Well, now I'll, now I'll read scripture here, now I'll pray the Psalms here, now I confess sin. And they all have value as individual, but, but when, you, when you bundle them together, the spiritual impact. Okay, the third thing um, that, that is important in the spirituality of the daily office is um, to, to think along with uh, a, uh, an Anglican writer by the name of Martin Thornton. I mentioned him earlier. And uh, his writing on, on Anglican spirituality, he talks about the three pillars of Anglican spirituality. And, and I think this is a good way <clears throat> for those of us in um, who are in or are approaching ordained ministry, what do we need to do, you know, in, in the sense of our spiritual life? Um, and, um, and then uh, regular Eucharist. So, it's a good thing for you to think about. Are, are you doing the daily office? Do you have your own set of kind of your own devotions? Um, whether that be Bible study or, or things of, of that nature that, that are particularly good for you. Um, and he points out that one of the things with Anglicanism is you have form and you have freedom. So the, the two bookends, Daily office and regular Eucharist, um, what, whatever a, a Bible study of prayer. Um, I have a whole thing on Anglican rosary that sometimes I share with people. People find that very helpful. Um, that we have wide latitude in that area, um, and that. So, so as you're as you're um, functioning as a priest, Astor, as you're preparing for this Cooper and, and John. <clears throat> One of the things that I, I would always ask people in process is, are you doing the daily office? Are you attending um, at least weekly Eucharist? And, and what's your own um, private devotional life like? Um, are you studying? Are you reading? Um, intercessory prayer and stuff like that. And, and, and I've done things like that on presbyters retreat, helping people do that. Okay, that, um, that leads to ministry with the daily office, two little quotes. Participation in liturgy <clears throat> is affected by one's understanding as to discipline. How leaders 
perform a the way the congregation responds to Chan's book, Liturgical Theology. In other words, um, uh, you need to understand, you need to be disciplined in your, in your use of the daily office if you're leading others, and uh, you need to have a good attitude <laughs> in what you're doing. And, and so um, I think that's a wonderful quote um, in this. And then the, my good friend who's prof who retired professor at uh, Trinity, um, liturgy is not Mr. Potato Head. Um, and and I, I use that to introduce us to the fact that um, it, it is really important for us to understand and master and, and use the forms as they come to us in the prayer book, um, rather than think we can, uh, you know, move them around like Mr. Potato Head, or we can improve on them. That is the temptation of most people coming from evangelical traditions. I like this. I don't like this, so I just won't use it. Oh, I can do this better. Um, you know, I don't like how the prayer book words it, so I'm going to do this. And, and my advice on that is resist those temptations. Um, ma master the prayer book. Uh, it, it has a lot of freedom in it. And you can, you can use that uh, freedom, but, but the prayer book is in, to, to use a um, kind of a metaphor from another place, it's, it's the fireplace to contain the fire. Um, you want the fire, but a fire without a fireplace is gonna burn the house down. And, and so um, let's, let's take a, a look now at, I'm gonna basically go through morning prayer because that'll also, um, that will also help us understand evening prayer. So uh, daily morning prayer, page 11 in your prayer book. And as I recommended, uh, I think it's always good to have a, a, a prayer book that you can take notes in and write in. Um, and I always have had one. Um, and I do talks from prayer books with just notes written in them. So what is, uh, let's start with something that isn't mentioned. What is the appropriate clothing um, to lead morning prayer, evening prayer. Is there appropriate clothing? What would you lead it in? Uh, um, street clothing is, is okay, um, but, but if you have, have the opportunity, what I would train people is, is um, to vest for it. And so appropriate vestments, um, if you're leading a, a service, appropriate vestments, evening prayer would, would, depending on the situation you're in, would, would be either a plain alb or a cassock, um, and uh, cassock and surplus. So um, do all of you have um, cassock and surpluses? Uh, Esther, I'm sure you do. John, do you have cassock and surplus? I'm trying to remember what you wear at Christ Church there. Um, are, are, is that a, a I don't have, or a cast? I don't have them myself, but they have a lot of extras for different things. So I'm sure we do have, have all the options. Okay, well, um, and that's, that's kind of what, what the church you're, you're in, um, what it tends to, you know, what's, what's acceptable there. Um, uh, for someone who is um, ordained clergy, often you wear a tippet with it. Um, and the tippet is the black scarf um, ra rather than a, a, a seasonal stole that you would use for the Eucharist. The, um, the common understanding is you use, um, use cassock and surplus um, with tippet for ordained clergy for, um, for choir offices at the Eucharist, you, you would use a stole um, uh, if you're ordained clergy. And uh, so uh, at some point we'll talk about another, another time. Um, if you have an academic degree, I swear you um, with the tippet over the prayer. 
Um, it started, this is uh, 1552. That's not how prayer book started for daily morning prayer, but it, since 1552 has. What, what are those sentences for? They're, they're really to focus our attention on the Lord and his presence. Um, and so they're not just kind of a throwaway introductory line, like here's Johnny or something like that. But, but they really alert us to the fact that, um, that um, attention needs to be given to the Lord in his presence, um, whether we feel he's present or not. And this is, this is really important because um, one of the things that I value so much in our Anglican tradition is the objectivity of it. The Lord is present. Now, I may not be tuned into it, but I don't have to beseech and call on him to be present. I don't have to work myself into a frenzy um, uh, or a certain kind of a feeling. And that's the value of doing the, the, day, the daily office. The Lord is here. He is here to meet with me. He is here to meet with his people. Um, he, he is asking for me to attune to him. I don't ask him to attune to me um, in, in that setting um, on that. Well, I may ask him, but he's, he, is, he is listening at, at that point. Um, I, I believe whenever possible, um, we, we come to worship our own private personal worship and uh, public worship um, with a sense of expectation. If we expect God to meet us, um, chances are um, we will have a much better uh, chance of getting what we expect than if we expect nothing. Um, now, now, the Lord is the Lord, and so he'll, he'll do what he needs to do. But if I come expecting somehow to hear a word from him or, or uh, a, a sense that it's much more likely to happen than if I just come, I've got to, you know, I've got to work through this. Sometimes we're, we're just in a period where we just have to, you know, say the prayers and do it. But even then as an expectation, we will get through this. Um, and uh, the Lord will speak to us. You notice following the confession of sin uh, I'm, is, is a long paragraph, which isn't often used. Um, most of the time, people skip right to let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God on page 12. But, but actually, the bidding starting at the bottom of page 11 is, is, is quite good. And I would encourage it to be used um, if you have the time, because it really spells out what we're doing. It says, um, this is what we're doing here um, in gathering as a, as a congregation, as people. This is what I'm doing if I'm doing this um, personally. I'm, I'm confessing um, my sins um, with humble and obedient hearts, expecting God's forgiveness. It's the first thing. Second thing on the next page, I'm giving thanks for the great benefits we've received at his hands. Third, I'm declaring his most, most worthy praise. And four, I'm here to hear his holy word and ask for that are necessary for life itself here in his opening statement you know here's here's what i'm gonna say and here it is this is what we're doing and so it alerts people and and, and when i use this this whole bidding at the beginning I, I like to pause on it so um so people again are are drawn into to what we're doing and then you notice the rubric and uh, uh, John, I said last week, um, pay it, do them, um, because they're there for a reason. We're not overloaded with words. I, I, some gave me instructions for a certain page as long, what you do. And I went, man, I, th that, that's like learning dancing and never dancing, because you're learning all the moves. Uh, not a, a lot of instructions here, but they're there for a reason. Silence is kept. All healing. When possible, people should kneel for, for this. They, they stand, they're alerted when they come in. Anglican tradition to begin the office, have them with a bell, to ring a bell. And then um, uh, people are standing, you introduce, you bid them. And then 
all kneel. Now I know some people can't kneel. Um, it's getting harder for me to kneel. No, it's actually it's the getting up part that I can't do more well. Um, but as I was saying, somebody this week, I was over a paper with him. Uh, our, our, our gestures, bodily postures are not just a, a sign of, 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 a, of, a, of a contrite heart, but they also predispose us to receive something. So, so we often think of gestures and stances as an outward expression of something going on inward. But I think they, they can all be performative like a sacrament, um, they themselves can teach our bodies, which are connected to our minds, to be humble in a, in a small way. And, and, and so to kneel, I think here is, is an important aspect. People always need to have the freedom to, to be seated, certainly. Um, uh, you know, there, there are people who um, have disabilities and they can't kneel. I, I understand that. But for those of us who can, um, this is a this is a wonderful wonderful place to kneel and to confess and notice the, the image there is we have erred and strayed from our ways like lost. Um, does that evoke the 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 one lost sheep and 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 calls for him? I mean, this is. This is a wonderful picture of what we're doing here. And then at the bottom of page 12, the priest alone stands and says, so people remain kneeling. And then there are two absolutions. The, the older form is the form of Cranmer. The, the short form um, is the more recent one. Um, but, but whether you use long or short, um, what they both communicate is that um, forgiveness of our sins, while it is not the total gospel, is certainly central to the gospel. Again, remember the, the Augustinian anthropology that we, we even, even in our regenerate form are still sinners and, and that we still need to humble ourselves before God and turn to him. Um, and that. Now, Below the two absolutions, it's important to see a deacon or a lay person remains kneeling and, and prays. So this is, this is not a absolution. Uh, I read one book, I called it an absolution. It, it's really just a, a prayer for forgiveness. That the is leading. Um, so as a lay person, um, uh, Cooper and John, this is what we would use as a transitional deacon. This is what you would use. Um, but when you're a priest, you use the other. Now, if you slip and use the other, um, lightning will not strike you from heaven. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I want to be clear again, uh, as I said, we all make mistakes. And, and sometimes if you're, you know, it's been a long day, you, you say the wrong thing. I, uh, not in this area, but I really screwed up something about two or three months ago because uh, our morning prayers at 7.30, I had a late night and I got up and I just said, hey, you know, sorry, I just really, I'm tired. I screwed this up. Let's start over kind of thing. That's okay. Um, that's the informality. I, I'm, I'm not a person. Uh, I think, um, Astra, I think you raised or Eric raised the question last time about giving instructions to people. Is that disruptive? Well, no, it's not. And particularly because we have new people coming into Anglican, we need to know what to do. And you don't have to give detailed instructions in every service, every place. But, but remember, and this is why I spent so much time doing something clergy do and we're taking you or you're just we're taking you along and uh, um, it needs to be a part of of morning prayer um, the rubric reads that um, if if you have, if you've done this once during the day, say you're doing morning prayer and you do evening prayer, you can, you can skip over confession. 
um, this opening part. And so the idea is that at least once a day in the daily office, you're confessing your sins. If you want to do it twice, there's no problem with that, but at least once a uh, day. And, and if you do, if you say evening prayer and moving to evening prayer, um, what you do is you start right with the invitatory um, uh, on 13 or uh, the appropriate place in evening prayer. So, so after the, the prayer for forgiveness or the absolution, then the congregation stands and you have the invitatory. Um, these are called the, the preces, uh, spelled P-R-E-C-E-S. It's again from a Latin for prayer. And uh, what these preces are, are, it's dialogue prayer, back and forth. It, it is customary in some places Again, I, I was trained in a more high, high church setting. So <laughs> um, uh, it's customary when you say, oh Lord, open our lips to make the sign of the cross on your lips. Uh, um, if you don't do that, nobody is gonna care. Um, but again, um, ritual done for meaning has a place, I think in Anglicanism. And uh, as I talked to, particular younger folk coming in, they appreciate that we have and, and that's where our explaining from. It's, it, it's not is the way I would explain it. So the invitatory, and then the top of page 14, then follows the, the vanity, uh, which is, which has been kind of the standard um, uh, for Anglican prayer since Cranmer. We do have an alternative, the Jubilate, which, which may be used. Um, and, and so one or, or the other, and, and this may be you know, said or chanted or sung. Um, most, of, most of morning and evening prayer can be said or sung. Um, in, uh, in a more formal setting, you might want to explore chanting. Um, that's a whole whole different kind of thing. My wife has taught several young priests chanting kind of thing. She's a musician, um, but you can certainly say it together too. Um, one of the things I want to say about the Venite, the Jubilate, um, and the Psalms is they are poetry. So if you're leading them, don't lead them like prose. Ah. Now, now you know something that is a pet peeve of mine. What do I mean? Look at the opening line to the Venite. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Pause. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Pause. Let us come to ourselves glad in him with psalms. That's your poetry is the, the and the, the development of a, of a rhythm there. Do not do, oh, come let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Um, their, their poetry has a reason. It, it communicates something. The, the rhythm is not just there for the heck of it. Yeah, it, it's, it's meant to give us a little chance to, to develop a rhythm um, and, and join in that rhythm with, uh, with the poetry here. Now you notice um, above the Venite are, th are three, um, uh, what, are, what are called the antiphons. Now there are no antiphons for evening prayer. This is just morning prayer. Um, and, and these are seasonal. There's a set of them. These are the standard ones. You can look on pages 29 and 30 for seasonal ant antiphons. Antiphons, um, notice, be sung or said before and after the invitatory song. Okay. May means you don't have to. Um, so um, I always said that the invitatory um, for Lent is, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy, pause, and the congregation responds, oh, come, let us adore him. The response is always the same by the congregation. Uh, these are three that can be used at any time and then the seasonal ones. So, so how you would lead morning prayer is you would, after, 
after the 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 precis on the on the page before, then you would go say we're using this. The earth is the Lord's, for He made it. O come, let us adore it. And then say together, or chant together, or sing together, either the Vanity or the Jubilate. Um, and then when you end, you come back. The earth is the Lord's, for He made it. O come, let us adore Him. Okay, does that make sense around it? Um, I don't know if you use the O antiphons um, during Advent, something we can talk another time, but um, this would be where you would use O antiphons. Um, on the Vanity, um, five verses may be omitted except in Lent. Um, uh, we're in Lent now, so don't admit them, <laughs> omit them. Um, but if you use this, use those verses, but you don't have to use them in other times of the year if you use this regularly. I know some settings to chant this, and that's that's um, the wording changed with this. I, the settings I know are for the 79 prayer book, but it's good to learn a musical setting, chant settings. Even if your congregation doesn't know them, you can sing them in your head, and that's how you remember stuff. It's a lot easier to remember stuff you sing than stuff you say, by the way. Um, uh, bottom of page 15. Um, during the first week of Easter, the Pascha Nostrum without ant antiphons is used in the place of the invitatory psalm and it may be used throughout the Easter. And that's the uh, invitatory on page 16, Pascha Nostrum, which is um, three the three different quotations from 1 Corinthians, Romans, and First Corinthians again. Um, and so you use that at least during Easter week. I like to use it during the whole Easter season because it gives me, gives me uh, a feel of the whole season. And it's wonderful because it teaches theology. It, it, it teaches the theology of the resurrection um, uh, in, in these quotations from First Corinthians and Romans. Okay, page 16 then follows the psalm or psalms appointed. So um, we're going to talk about calendars at another time, but are you all familiar with the fact that the psalms and the lessons we use for the daily office are in the back of this prayer book? And they are on page, they start on page, let's see. Uh, they start on page 738. Um, now there's an explanation of them. No, I guess there isn't. So at page 738, um, and they, they are set to the calendar year. Um, and they, um, they basically read through the scripture except for a, um, a handful of special feast days or fast days. Um, so there's the 60 day Psalter in the first and the second lesson um, in that. And we'll talk about where this, this lectionary came from, special circumstances, use, use those lectionaries and use those Psalms, um, the set of Psalms for morning prayer and the Psalms for evening prayer. Um, Psalms were the center of monastic worship, so they're important. And the thing about this prayer book is it has the Psalter in it. So um, you don't have to have another book to do the Psalter because you, know, um, you, could, you could use them out of another translation of the Bible. But the nice thing about this Psalter, um, which which comes from um, is it's uh, is it's metrical. Um, the lines work in the way that a psalter should. And if you use a Bible, most Bible translations, you got it, it doesn't work well with with um, the, the meter is not there in most Bible translations, unfortunately. Um, there are four ways you can do psalms. Okay, so just know this. Um, you can say them all together uh, as a congregation. That's direct recitation. Um, two, you can do it antiphonally. So divide up the congregation into two parts. So 
you know, right side, left side, um, however a congregation can be divided. And say it's right to the left. The right side does the first half of the verse. The left side does the second half of the verse. You can do them responsorially, um, which is to say um, you have a refrain that the congregation says, and the verses can either be read or chanted by a cantor, or you can do them responsively, which is um, the congregation responding to you as the efficient. Um, some people like to do that by half verse at the asterisks and at the end of verses. The, the more standard way is to do it by whole verses. So, you know, if a psalm has verses, you would read the first verse, congregation second, third, fourth. You need to train, if you're doing this in public worship, you need to train the congregation um, in, in whatever way your church does it. Uh, how do you do psalms at uh, St. David's, Aster, by the way? Esther, how do you psalms at St. David's? <laughs> Sorry, I thought I yeah, responsively. Okay, yeah, and that's 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 easy. Uh, we at uh, this will be true. Uh, congregation responding to chanted verses, but. But however you do it, uh, develop and train congregations for it. Okay, the lessons. Um, oh, by the way, I just want to give you a great Augustine quote. Um, uh, Augustine says that the Psalms are two about uh, Psalms are two Christ or about Christ in Christ. Psalms are not just the, this Old Testament kind of thing that we're doing because we have that in our Bible. But at the center of the Psalms, um, we're praying with Jesus as he prayed the Psalms. Um, we're praying to him. And, uh, in him and that. 